Increasingly, technologies are coupled to cultural and natural heritage, resulting in new ontologies, heritage practices, and an unprecedented emergence of theoretical and practical challenges. Day two of the keynote sessions draws together many of the best thinkers and practitioners in the world of the future of museums and virtual museums, those that are exploring ways of mapping both experience and heritage into new cultural forms. I think this quote from Preziosi is useful when it comes to describing the latent potential and unbelievable promise of contemporary museums to permeate the cultural imaginary of our technologically mediated worlds. It becomes clear, he says, that we are dealing here with an invention, an institution, a technology, indeed an agency of extraordinary power and brilliance. The museum is a theater of anamorphic and autoscopic dramaturgy, a place which is not so easy to tell which is the spider and which is the web, which the, is, which the machine and which the operator. It is a place at the center of our world, our modernity, in the image of which whose worlds continue to proliferate. So on that note, I'd welcome Robert Stein, Deputy Director of the Dallas Art Museum, to host the session today. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, appreciate everyone being here. Uh, this morning, uh, uh, I'm pleased to be with you again. My name is Robert Stein. I'm from the Dallas Museum of Art. And I'm pleased to welcome Lars Nitva, the executive director of M Plus in the West Kowloon Cultural District. Lars will tell us a little bit this morning uh, about his work at the museum and reinventing museum practice here in Hong Kong. Uh, Lars will, uh, will share his talk with you and then we'll have some time uh, for questions at the end. So with, without further ado, Lars, uh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, brilliant. Thank you very much. Hi, good morning. Uh, good morning, Connor. Uh, a colleague just entered the room. Well, I guess we're many colleagues here because uh, <clears throat> there is definitely a museum angle to this conference. It's quite interesting. There are three conferences that are going on or have been going on in Hong Kong, sort of, to a certain extent, crossing uh, each other's topics in a way. There was, we have just, M plus ha just uh, concluded a partly closed door and, and partly open door conference yesterday about uh, collecting design and design issues and, and sort of global aspects of design. And of course, there's the business of design week also that have started. And then, then we have, as a sort of jewel in the crown, this conference. And I think it's, it's really amazing the amount of exchange that happens in Hong Kong right now, which of course reflects um, a rapid development going on, I think, in Hong Kong of which um, I suppose this project that I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, is a part. Uh, <clears throat> I suppose uh, I was thinking about how I should sort of pitch this, uh, this presentation because, of course, many of you will be from Hong Kong and you may have heard this 50, 50, 55 times or 100 times already, what I'm going to talk about, but some of you clearly are not from Hong Kong and may not have a, heard a word about, about M plus and what it's about. I'll basically uh, make a presentation of, of the project. I mean, what are we up to? But I'll try to also angle it a little bit towards, uh, how shall I put it, things digital. Uh, so, and, and to aspects that might be extra relevant to, to this conference. And I, I suppose maybe some of the questions will go in that direction as well. We'll see. We'll just take it from there. My expertise is not particularly in, in, uh, in the sort of core area of the conference. It's more I'm a sort of just a regular museum director, art historian from the beginning. Anyway, uh, so this museum we're going to talk about is called M+. And it's a museum to be, I should say. It doesn't mean that um, we will call it a museum first when we have a building. We actually 
in certain ways talk about it as something that already exists because we do have public activities, we do exist, we do, we do make exhibitions now and then uh, in various places in, in Hong Kong. And of course we have, uh, in terms of, of dissemination of ideas and dialogues and meeting a public, we're still relatively active even though we're still a small team. But buildings are usually interesting and they do play a, a sort of symbolic role, I think, for defining a museum as well. And this is the location of where the future museum will be built. I'll come back a little bit to the building, but I can just mention that in exactly a week from now we will launch the shortlist for the architects for, for the building. And uh, we plan to open the doors in almost exactly five years from now. But um, as I said, I mean, the building is not really um, the museum. I think that the whole, one of the ambitions we have with this project is really to build a museum from inside out. To start with ideas, to build a team as a sort of consequence of ideas, and as, of course also to bring them in to continue to build on the ideas and actually also to develop a content. And then, basically look at, look at the building as a, uh, as a tool, in a sense. And this project didn't start uh, actually when, uh, first when we had a team on board. We've had, people have been working on this project for about two years, including me. I, I started almost exactly on the day two years ago with this. But already in 2006, Hong Kong government uh, asked a group of, of really smart people from Hong Kong to sit down and actually they spent a year thinking through what, what does actually Hong Kong need? Um, does it need a museum? Does it need five museums or four museums? What kind of museum if so? There was a sense of, of, of a need that something needed to be added to the ecology of Hong Kong. But what exactly should it be? And this museum advisory group came up with this um, proposed mission statement six years ago now, and it says, said that the mission of M plus is to focus on 20th and 21st century visual culture, broadly defined from a Hong Kong perspective and with a global vision. And then it goes on with something that is more, I think, every museum have or should have in their, in their mission statement, that it should be open and flexible and forward-looking and inspire and delight and educate and so on. Let's, I mean, that's good and so, but it's not the important part. I think that the important part is that uh, we should be a museum of 20th and 21st century visual culture broadly defined and look at the world from a Hong Kong perspective. I think that's a core thing. So when we started uh, thinking about what this museum should be two years ago, we actually tried to put this aside and think again. And we had a large number of roundtable discussions and so meeting practitioners and writers and critics and, and, and collectors and, and people in, in the sort of in the market and all types of stakeholders and really started to test ideas and listen to their views and so forth. And then from that process, and of course we brought in some ideas ourselves as well, uh, we sort of uh, concluded and we almost ended up with exactly the same story or the same idea for w how the museum should position itself. So uh, it was just an interesting exercise to go through, to look at this advisory group's recommendation uh, that was then, at that time, four years ago, and see that actually, yes, we did come to the same conclusion. Now, when I was um, asked to come here and recruited to this, I had a number of discussions with the decision makers of Hong Kong. And of course, I was quite interested in, in sounding them out what they thought this should be about. What, what's the sort of, what's the basis of this museum? And um, it struck me that it really basically rests on three pillars. And maybe this is not only true for M+, but, and I should really have said this also, but it also maybe holds, I think it holds true for the whole district we're a part of, because M plus is a part of what you see here. Is there a little nice laser pointer somewhere? Maybe not. 
Uh, but I can, well, you see this area, this sort of peninsula that sticks out here, that looks rather green with, with some buildings on it uh, in one part here, is, is basically what, we, what is called West, uh, West Kaloon Cultural District, which is meant to be, thank you, in the middle, that one. So it's actually this area, which is now a piece of barren land. Uh, it's actually uh, so-called reclaimed land, which is an interesting word, since I don't think it ever was there before, but, but uh, nevertheless, reclaimed land. And on this, uh, there will be a number of cultural venues uh, built most of them performing arts related and basically creating new venues for existing um, say orchestras or theater groups or dance groups and so in Hong Kong. But the museum is different in the sense that it's actually an institution that is created from scratch, scratch again. So I'll go back to these pillars again. And basically you can say that the project at the basis one thing that is important about it and that struck me in these conversations was that it's a very ambitious project. It's not only ambitious in terms of potential size of buildings and, and so forth, but also uh, it's ambitious in terms of how it was phrased to me as a, uh, it's really there in order to try to create an institution that in a way raises the bar in our part of the world, sets a new standard and, and can be an inspiration for other museums in the region and in this, our part of the world. I will try to do that. But also the other, the second one is that it's, it's a project with a very strong public service ethos. It's really intended to try to add something to the mix in Hong Kong which is not provided for by the commercial sector or, or, or by, by the market in a way, but actually to complement that. And, and that was underlined, it's not driven by tourism or the idea of tourism. I mean, it's, in that sense, it's very different from, say, what you typically get in Abu Dhabi or, or Qatar or something like that, where, of course, the main potential future audience for the big museum projects is that you, that you will have large tourist numbers. This is really a project which sort of defines itself as a museum that's built for the people who live and work here in Hong Kong. And it should be rooted in Hong Kong, it should reflect uh, its location. Now you can say that this makes it a perfect tourist attraction as well, because of course the reason why we travel is usually that we're looking for difference, we're looking for something else, not for the things we already know. So in a way, I think it's rather likely that of, when we look at our audience figures five years after the opening, that the museum, after all, will have quite a large portion of, of tourists. But it's, that's not the driver behind the project. That's not the sort of driver behind the idea so, uh, uh, that we're developing. The third pillar, I think, was what attracted me, especially in combination with the two first ones, and that is that we were basically asked to try to rethink what a museum could be in the 21st century and in this part of the world. What does it mean to create a museum now? And we were not asked, which typically would be the case, I think, when you, when, especially when you're talking about a very large project with large sums of money, to replicate something that, that is already there and you can get sort of a rather safe result by doing that. But actually we're asked to challenge the givens in a sense. And for me, I think that's very important and was very, it's, it, it was a very attractive thought. While at the same time, I think it's quite important to create something that is still recognized as a museum. I think that the museum as a concept, as a sort of public space where, uh, where a content can meet the audience and, and it has a certain symbolic value, is really important to maintain. So we're trying at the same time to create something that is recognizable still as a museum, that people feel that they are, whether they're going to the, to the building or they're going into the sort of digital aspects of the building, so to say, that they actually think that they're going to a museum, even if they do it on their screen at home or wherever they are. And of course, if you're a museum, you will collect 
and you will exhibit and you will educate. And I don't think I have to go deep into that, even though, of course, one can, I'm sure, or definitely problematize and discuss each of these words, uh, collect and collection and what that means. And uh, uh, showing, exhibiting and displaying can also be problematized in various ways. And definitely education is not a word that is sort of means just one thing, but it means many things and it can be done in many, many different ways. But I'll sort of pass that one for the moment at least. I said that M plus is a museum and we define it as a museum of visual culture. <clears throat> and that basically, if we use the sort of categories that we, most of us use, uh, it means that it includes things like what we call visual art and contemporary art, but not only modern and contemporary art, but also uh, the, the part of the art story that is actually has its root in this part of the world, uh, which can be called ink art. Also, uh, we include what is sometimes called moving image, uh, not only cinema and video art, but, but various types of moving image. Popular culture, which is a slightly different type of category though, but it's an indication that high and low is not necessarily uh, parameters that we're using in, in how, we, how we think about what we're doing or what we're showing and what we're working with. Of course, design and architecture are also categories that would be part of this. And if you look now at these sort of concentric circles, uh, or these circles sit, not concentric, they're actually overlapping circles, um, sort of, you see that there is this thing we call art sits a little bit like a bigger circle, and the other ones sit within and outside that circle. I think what that indicates is that our ambition is to create a museum where we rather embrace a dialogue situation between these different categories rather than separating, separating them. Of course, there has been museums of visual culture um, since 1929 at least, when MoMA was founded, MoMA in New York was founded, which has distinct sort of departments for design and architecture and moving image and, and, and uh, painting and sculpture and drawings and photography and so even more subdivisions than I use here in this plan. But I think we'll move away from that, that uh, model and actually have as, as the main sort of idea to, to embrace the fluidity between these categories, while at the same time, and that's why the circles sort of stick a little bit out on their own, outside the center, uh, central circle also, uh, while also, of course, totally respecting the fact that things that happen within, let's say, ink art or whether it's within moving image is not only a result of a sort of a dialogue between various categories, cultural categories, but actually, of course, they are also results of, of developments that happen within a particular industry or uh, technique or so. I mean, I was, before I came here, I was, uh, I was director of a museum in Stockholm, uh, which, had, which is a museum of modern art, modern and contemporary art, which, uh, which has this type of collection you'd expect. But all, it also has a large photography collection, which starts in the 1840s and goes up to the present. And of course, that's a very clear example of how you can both work naturally with an integration between of course, the development and what happened in photography and what happened in painting and, and other visual art media on one hand. And so the main story could be integrated. But at the same time, of course, it's obvious that what has happened within photography has also been a result of influences and developments within that particular category. May it be new techniques, new cameras, new films, new dis distribution forms, uh, color printing, you name it. Of course, and that's also been a driver uh, within, and of course, influences be between photographers for why photography has changed, why it looks the way it looks, in a sense. So the, you have double stories, in a sense. I think the reason why we have decided to do this and, and to have this, to have as a, the main sort of 
main thrust to, to, to work towards some sort of dialogue situation, and integration may not be the right word, but to embrace that fluidity is, I suppose, there are basically two reasons, I think. One is that uh, if you look at the world of visual culture, and not the least art, contemporary art, in the last, say, 30 years or so, it's quite clear that many of the most interesting things that have been happening have been happening in the border areas between the categories we have defined. And, and that, that uh, I mean, how things can move, I mean, that was very obvious actually in, in, in the design conference we had yesterday evening where, where um, Paola Antonelli from the Museum of Modern Art made a presentation of of what she thought, some things that she thought was really important and, and intriguing within the development of, of design right now. And, and to me, all her examples could easily, very easily, be reframed as artworks instead. You could actually look upon them art, as artworks, and you would basically describe them in the same language, but you would probably see slightly different things in the same things you would sort of get different meanings out of them depending on how they were framed, if they were framed as, as design or if they were framed as artworks. So, but we have, I think, this type of development where things move across the borders. I mean, it's obvious within the field of moving image, for example, where, where it's really quite often a question whether you look at something in a black box standing looking at a projection on the wall or you sit in a cinema setting like this one actually is what defines whether you're looking at a movie or you're looking at an artwork. I mean, you all know this. So you have that type of fluidity and I think it's, it's quite important and we should be able to play it in a sense. But there is an aspect that I think has to do more with where we are and, and, and uh, the specificities of, I think you can say, Asia in general, but definitely Asia is, by the way, of course, a rather uh, difficult uh, concept in a sense. It's rather hard to define when you start thinking about it, and it's actually a, a, a concept that is changing in itself continuously, and its borders and so forth, and its meaning changes. But anyway, uh, so you can, you can see that, that there, there are differences I think that there are, there's this Asian reason, and there is particularly a Hong Kong reason for this approach as well. And of course, at the basis, it has to do with the fact that, that these concepts are not given by nature. I mean, design, architecture, uh, moving in cinema, and so forth, or art. They are constructs, and they're Western constructs. And they don't have the same kind of history here as they have in, say, Europe or in America. And that also, I think, have created quite early on a, a, a sort of natural fluidity between the categories. If you look at, I mean, art in Japan or design in Japan, it's, uh, I mean, you have had a flow between categories that's been going on for decades. And if you look at Hong Kong, um, of course, a number of the most well-known and celebrated artists are also among the most well-known and celebrated, say, designers or even advertising people or architects. Uh, I remember yesterday when, when uh, again, when Paolo Antonelli from MoMA was speaking and in front of her sat Stanley Wong, um, Hong Kong artist, Hong Kong photographer, Hong Kong graphic designer and Hong Kong advertising man. And he's actually totally celebrated in all these four categories. And he could fit into four or at least three of the departments of MoMA easily. And he would be collected by totally different teams then. Um, and the, I think this is Hong Kong, actually, that, that the, you have this possibility here to, to work in different categories and actually, which is possible anywhere, because uh, at least in the free world. but. It's very hard if you come out of, of design or if you come out of advertising to be respected as an artist at the same time. Andy Warhol is probably the one exception, but he actually left one field for the other. But otherwise, it's almost impossible, but it's totally possible here.
it's almost a given, it's almost a road to success, I would say. So um, I think we have just a totally different situation here that we should also as a museum naturally reflect. Now, <coughs> uh, visual culture is one aspect of what we're doing. And the other is that we say that we have a global vision. And of course, you can always wonder, what do we mean by global vision? Well, I think what we're doing is not so strange, actually. What we're trying to do is basically what all Western museums with an international or global or however they like to express it, vision, what they've been doing all the way. When I, when I worked at Tate Modern, of course, we thought we were an international or a global museum. And, but if you look at, if you walk around in, in the Tate Modern collection, or in the Centre Pompidou collection, or any major Western collection, you never doubt where you are. I mean, you never doubt when you walk around in the Tate Modern collection that you're in London. There are many London artists there, are many, and many UK artists and many European artists. But there are also artists from other parts of the world, beyond the West as well. And if you start analyzing the collection, you can also see that the collection, of course, is very comprehensive when it comes to, to British art, for example. It's the best collection in the world of British art. And it's pretty good when it comes to, to the closest European countries, less so when you go further afield, especially towards the East, of course. And then you can see that the acquisitions from other parts of the world, be it Africa, South America, or Asia, are quite strategic. It's really, they're really choices, or should be choices, that they're works that have been acquired to make sense in relationship to our, our reflections of the perspective that is at the core. So, I mean, to put it very simply, what we're aiming at is to do the same, but from a Hong Kong perspective, so at the core should be Hong Kong and the Pearl River Delta and China. And that would be our core, I would say. And, but of course, we will not stop there. We don't make it a local or a regional museum. We want it to be a museum that actually ref looks at the world, but from our perspective. So, of course, the layers of what we call Asia should also be comparatively well represented and, and so much more so than, than typically a Euro European or an American museum would do. But of course, we will also look at the West and the rest, or the rest and the West. And, but these choices have to be quite strategic and have to really have a particular meaning in relationship to the core of the collection. I mean, the first non-Asian work of art we have acquired for the collection actually was, and it's a, it's a, it's a s small and, and not, uh, not, it's not like a major, major acquisition, but it's a very good work, is by a South African artist, Candice Brights, who has made um, a work which is about uh, Hong Kong, or actually Hong Kong-Vancouver triplets. Um, their sort of Hong Kong family partly grew up in Vancouver, partly in Hong Kong, and they talk about their life as triplets and as having this sort of double cultural identity. And of course, that's a, it's a work that makes total sense in a Hong Kong museum in relationship to, uh, to the story we're telling. So, I mean, just as a sort of very simple uh, example. Or if we went more historical, I, I would say that um, it would be really interesting to, for example, have um, some of the works that Rauschenberg produced in China in the 1980s, works that were actually quite influential and, and made an, had an impact in China in the 80s. It was the first, at least, well-known Western artist who came and really worked there and, and um, sort of interacted with Chinese artists at a very sort of crucial time. Of course, uh, we're not only about collections. We're also um, planning to do exhibitions. And exhibitions, of course, is a, is a word that is a sort of collects many different types of public activities that are not related directly to the collection. And I think that one of the aims we have is to create a platform for Hong Kong artists uh, with lots of spotlights on it and, and artists from the region and artists from China to be, so they can be seen by the rest of the world, 
to a larger extent than now. So something that, that actually, hopefully, the world cares about and thinks about when we do it. And another thing is, of course, to bring art from other parts of the world to Hong Kong. This is something that we have been missing a lot. I mean, the only opportunity, really, that we've had to see major works of art from other parts of the world in Hong Kong has been at the auction previews and recent years at the art fair. Uh, and it may not be the framing and the curatorial framework that, that is the best suited for sort of uh, a wider public's coming to grips with uh, what has been happening and what is happening in other parts of the world in, in terms of art. So that's quite important. Another thing that we have started working on, and I... I I find we've been in, extremely encouraged in, in this process. We've started up a number of dialogues with artists who have a Hong Kong or Chinese background, but who are first, second, third generation artists living in other parts of the world, uh, be it in the US, in Canada, in France, or elsewhere, who have an identity both maybe as Canadians, but also, or Americans, but also as Chinese. So uh, we're talking to, we, and it actually was proposed by an artist also saying that maybe couldn't you, in Ho Hong Kong would be perfect for that, be like a home away from home for the, the artist in the diaspora. And this is, a, this is a really interesting discussion we have. Now, I said that already before that the museum is not the same as the building. You shouldn't confuse the two, actually. It's a relationship. The museum is a relationship between uh, its contents uh, and, and its audiences, in a sense. And of course, it can, these meetings can take place in many different venues, places, situations, and so forth. I think it's very important to sort of not be too dramatic about, about the building. I think sometimes there is an uh, well, always almost, there is an over-focus on the building. There's a huge interest in who will be shortlisted for building the M plus building. I think it should be much more interesting what, how are we building the collection, what will the collection be, or what are our ideas about, about the museum than about what will the building be like. But this is reality and, it, and it, of course there are many reasons for this. And at the same time, of course, the building is a tool. It's probably the most important tool we have. And it does, as I think I said initially, I mean, it also has <coughs> uh, the symbolic value of the building is quite important. It sort of symbolizes the idea of, the muse of a museum, which is, in, well, one way to describe it is, I guess, a safe place for ideas a place where ideas can, can meet its audiences and so forth. And the, the museum symbolizes that to a large extent. So uh, I'm downplaying the building in one way, but we're also building something. And it's quite substantial what we're building. The present plans, and of course, they can be adjusted. We don't have to build this, but we at the present, our analysis of what we think we will be doing and the way it seems that the collection is going, uh, we, this is what we think we will need. So uh, we will build the building in total in the first phase, actually. There is provision for a second phase at, at a later point, when and if needed. Uh, but it's, uh, it's planned to be 62,000 square meters. Uh, which is about 650,000 square feet, I guess, around there. And this would give us about 17,000 square meters exhibition space, give or take 1,000 or 2,000, depending on the final design of the building. Um, it also includes, and that's the reason for the size also, a large conservation and storage facility. So we have all that in one site. That was not the intention from the beginning, but it turned out that this was actually both, interestingly enough, that this has to do with land costs and so forth in Hong Kong, but both, of course, it's, it's from an operational point of view, uh, the best. But it also uh, is, it turned out to be the most economical, or actually, actually, at least it wouldn't be more expensive to do it this way. And of course, if you can have everything in one building, it's really good. And it will have um, learning spaces, theaters, a library and resource center, 
outdoor plazas, and also we will build, that's actually not part of these, uh, these square meters, but a num over time we will build a number of smaller uh, art pavilions or arts pavilions uh, in the park or in the district as well, which will not be operated by us. us. They, will just, they will be made available for, uh, for art groups and designers and so who needs exhibition space because there's a lack, general lack of exhibition space in Hong Kong. And a museum like ours, even if it's big, we cannot be a museum for everybody and show everything and everybody. That's impossible. So we want to have more venues in, as a part of the, uh, as a part of the fabric of, of the whole uh, cultural district. And of course, we will also have a public art program. And the, so we are now in the process of discussing and talking about uh, along the selection of landscape architects that we also will uh, integrate and work with, with artists from day one when we create the park and the landscape so we get some phenomenal works of art integrated into the landscape, but they will be part of the museum at the same time. They will be looked after and chosen by and so forth, the museum. <coughs> now maybe we're getting a little bit closer to, to more a little bit the subject of the conferences. What we'll try to do also is, of course, we will have uh, white cubes and black boxes and all the types of spaces you expect to find in a museum. But we're also trying to, and this is still early stages, rethink uh, the kind of spaces and think about are there other spaces that we need in the museum that are not fully developed yet? And what could they be? For example, is there uh, an Asian type of display not yet explored. And I mean, this is, just, I'm, I'm not sure there is one Asian type of display. I think, I'm, of course, this is, uh, this is really short for a big complex, total complex. But for example, what we have noticed is that we will have works that are typically, uh, I mean, they're made on scrolls and they are stored as scrolls. In, on, as rolls, basically. And when you look at them, if you, if you go to a museum, typically, uh, almost anywhere in, in this part of the world, and you, and you look at, at ink paintings or so, they sit on the wall most of the time behind glass, and you look at them as Western paintings. Occasionally, they can be on a table, and you, but you still look at them, and they're all there in one go. If you go to a collector, a scholar, they, it's a totally different experience. First of all, usually the space is much more intimate. It's an in, intimate situation. And that doesn't just have to do with that it might be a private home or a private person, but it sort of comes with the territory almost. And then you have this process where you pull out a scroll from its storage and you unroll it step by step and you discover it step by step. And then you have it unrolled perhaps and you maybe I should say, try to read the, the poem or uh, the script, the calligraphy, and you sit down and you ponder it, and you, maybe you're a small group of people and you discuss it, and, it's a, and then you roll it up again and put it away. And this is a totally different type of process than from looking at, a, at pictures in an exhibition. It's a different thing. It's a different process. It, it has a different element of intimacy in it, uh, there is a sort of interaction with the material, a process of discovery, so forth, that really hasn't been explored and developed in museums. And this is something we're looking at. And, I mean, it is about physical space. It may be about staffing, having people who actually can help, so you can actually can do this. But of course, many works may be so sensitive, so you can't roll and roll and roll and roll forever, even though they're quite sturdy, the scrolls actually, so they're made for this. But we've also talked to, to Jeffrey, Professor Jeffrey Shaw here. We've started to talk a little bit about the possibilities of, of developing digital ways of simulating this experience or enhancing this experience in various ways, both, of course, in terms of this gradual uh, discovery, but also the translation aspect and, and so forth, while retaining the intimacy. Some attempts, some, some things have been done in the field, 
the Palace Museum in Taipei, for example, have, have, have made some, some attempts in this direction, and some of them are, are quite successful. But I think there's still a lot of things that could be done in the field, and this is something that we would like to ex explore, to create, actually, a rather different viewing situation than, we've, than you can uh, experience in many other museums. Just as an example, another Geoffrey Shaw thing, the T visionary, uh, or visuar, T visionary, visionarium is the word, T visionarium. And this is something that also is an early discussion, but, but uh, it was very inspirational, and I'm sure you already have seen this, or otherwise you should see it uh, when you're here. Uh, <clears throat> but when you think about moving image, the problem you usually have as a visitor or in a museum is that you, you look at one thing, and you look at it in a cinema or in a black box, and you look at that thing. But you have very few opportunities to have the sort of active process you have when you're in an exhibition with, say, paintings on the walls, where you can compare, and you can go back and forth, and you can investigate, and so forth, and, and have that type of process. The, the, this, this sort of model where you actually can sort of group and compare and select uh, material and, and actually curate your and, and investigate actively as a viewer, of course, would be a major step forward also, not only in relationship to, as in this case, uh, uh, Australian television, but actually, say, Hong Kong cinema example, it would be fantastic, or other, any, any type of moving image material, of course. So this is something that also we would like to explore and, and move towards. Um, this is something I've, uh, this is a third example uh, of some sort of third place, or an example of a sort of third place between, between the, uh, the exhibition space and the storage, the dark storage down in the basement somewhere. Uh, in most museums, you have this thing that either you have, it's totally accessible, things are on display in the galleries, or they are hidden and secret, and you don't know what is there, and especially not where it is. You may, of course, the, the only sort of third space you may have, and it can be good, can be the digital space, of course, that you have on, on your screen. You can see what's in the collection and so forth. This is something that actually has a, trying to create this third space, has a long history uh, in, in museums. And I think the driver in that area was Pontus Ulten, a country fellow of mine, and who, who actually uh, set up a number of major museums around the world, among them Moderna Museet in Stockholm and Centre Pompidou, and, and, but also well, he was instrumental for, for example, the, the de Menil Museum in, in Houston. And in all these museums, from the late 50s or early 60s and onwards, he tried to find ways of making the works, at least some of the works that were in storage, more accessible. And actually, it was in a way a failure one after the other, because it was either uh, you had security issues or you had, or you had technology issues. In a way, the closest maybe he got was in a way to uh, the, 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 the storage in the De Menil Museum, designed by Renzo Piano, by the way, in, in, in Houston, where uh, the, the, the storage is on the top floor of the museum and has a nice skylights, and it's a very friendly environment. So it's like a study library more than, than, than a storage, and therefore more accessible. But of course, it not, it's not open to everybody just to stroll in. It's by appointment, or I don't know exactly how they run it. Now, Pontus Sultan uh, was the founding director of the Moderna Museet, where I was director. And it, the museum was founded in 1958. And he passed away in uh, 2007. And in 2008, uh, we celebrated our 50th anniversary. And in a way, as a celebration of of his attempts, we actually tried to get closer to realizing his dream and to create something that is like a duke box for art, more or less. 
where the storage actually is accessible to you as, as a visitor. In the center of the, mu in, uh, at the core of the museum, where you have uh, a number of screens, a number of walls that you choose, which either single work, like you have up there, you have an, an, a dance diagram by Andy Warhol from 1963, or a group of works. Um, and you can, on a, on a touch screen, you can choose what you want to see. And it's about 600 works you have available. And it's basically a robot. It's uh, from the car industry uh, that we, we sort of just sh changed it. And it brings these things down and in front of you. And you can look at it. You can basically just see more. You can basically see as much as we have in the galleries. You can see also uh, in this, uh, as it's called, Pontus Sultan Study Gallery. And <clears throat> I think the aesthetics of this and how it's done was driven by uh, Pontus' idea and also Renzo's Pian Renzo Piano's idea of how it should be done. I think it can be done in many different ways. Um, they were quite keen on this sort of quite physical experience that it shouldn't be too smooth and, and robotic, but actually a little bit like ch -ch 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 coming down in front of you like that. And, and you, I think you can do it in different ways. We may do it differently in M+, but it's a route we want to explore anyway, to create more access to more works. Of course, there are certain types of works that are more, that sort of are more uh, easier to sort of display in this way than others. But it was not super expensive, and it's extremely popular, and it works really well. And it has now been working for four years and is very happy. So um, this is something that we'll explore and try to develop to do something like that. And it really has to do with this, this image also of opening up the sort of border between front of house and back of house. There are lots of things that are going on in what is called back of house in a museum. For example, the conservation processes and other, other things that are extremely secret as it is now. And it's actually some of the most instructive and, and interesting processes that happen in the museum, because there are lots of decision making about, uh, about history and meaning and so forth that also goes on. Besides, it gives an, an, a chance for understanding how, how artworks come, you know, how they're made and why they're made the way they are and, and what, what are the sort of reasons for certain choices of material and so forth. So we'll try to, of course, there are limits in terms of security, in terms of other things to make the back of house more available. But I think you can increase the transparency. You don't want to make the staff and the poor conservators feel like they're, they're sort of goldfish in a bowl, of course. But, but I think there are things you can do about this to open up. And I, I know also that there are some attempts in different parts of the world to do that. But of course, I'm sure this is a pathetic picture from your perspective if you're experts in the field. But just to indicate um, that and this is a mantra we really have in the museum that, OK, now we, are, are, we have an architecture competition coming up. And there's a lot of focus on spending huge sums of money on the building. But we also have to remember that, that we also have to build another building, a parallel structure that is the non-physical, the digital aspect of the museum, the digital platform, so to say, of the museum. And that it's really, these days, you have to think about it as as something that is, it's really two sides of the same thing. And, and it's very easy that you, I think, you still, that you forget this other non-physical part of it. And you think about it as something that you plug in later. And I don't think you can do that. So these discussions are, of course, going on on a very fundamental level when it comes to the, the actual infrastructure in the whole district and, and how, how um, the whole district, will, what sort of digital interface it will have and what it can do in terms of ticketing and, I mean, all aspects you can think of. But also, of course, it has to do with what the museum, how you could, should be able to access works in the museum, how you can create a platform for works that are, just have a digital life, and so on and so forth. So this is a, naturally a very central aspect in what we're doing. 
I guess I can say much more about this, but, but whatever I say will probably sound very amateurish from your point of view. But I mean, it's, it's a given that, that, that the, uh, the digital side of a museum is, I don't even think you should talk about it as a digital side. I mean, because then you should also talk about the museum, the physical side of the museum, which is the building and the galleries and so forth. Because <coughs> it's obvious that it, just as much as you have education and interpretation in the building and real people talking and, and giving talks or docents and so forth, you have a digital aspect of that. Just as much as you have galleries that show artists in a physical space, of course we will have, uh, so to say, galleries or, or platforms that show artists in the digital space, artists who choose to work in that medium simply. And, and uh, of course it, there is the sort of indirect access to the, to, the, to the more physical works of art as well. And there you can, I mean, I think it's important to remember that these are not the works. These are, are references to the works. But you should still be able to, to learn and investigate and, and, and um, curate and so forth, I think, in the digital space in order as a part of a learning and information process. And then, of course, it's the whole both information and of course, marketing side of, of the digital space. So it's an important, extremely important aspect of the museum. And another uh, reminder of the fact that, that the museum doesn't stop just because you walk in or, uh, or walk out of the museum building, just in the, um, in the space around us, in the park, as I mentioned, of course, that will be public art. And also, since we now claim that the museum is not the same as the building. Why don't we start doing projects now? And actually, we did do that a year ago. First, with, um, in, in connection with a big project that our performing art uh, friends in, in the cultural district did, a big bamboo theater with Cantonese opera. We also made an exhibition in relationship to that. And uh, with a number of of artworks, especially commissioned. Artworks of very different types commissioned for this. this. This was a new media application by Henry Chu and Samson Young that was made for iPhones, iPads, and so forth. It was a sound and, and vision piece. And we did a bamboo theater also, where a marathon screening of, of movies relating to the idea or the plot of, of, of uh, Cantonese opera, which is a, the plot, the sort of standard plot in the Cantonese opera has also been used a lot in, in Hong Kong cinema, maybe in crime movies or so. That's the sort of, it reoccurs in many, many shapes. And we had a very, very popular marathon screening of, of those kind of movies last January. And we moved on also to do a project in Yamate, which is the heart and soul of Hong Kong, in a way, here in Kowloon, where we worked with a number of artists who commi we commissioned pieces and they installed them in found spaces, basically. It could be an abandoned storefront or under a flyover or in a, or in a small city park or so. The choices of theirs. And this was <coughs> one of the works by Chang King Wa, the fourth seal, which is a a very elaborate uh, projection work, text projection work, um, that was displayed in a specially built, temporary building actually, under a flyover in Yamate. So all these things, moving out into the neighborhoods, acting outside the building, is also something we'll continue to do. And I just refer to these, uh, the first of the M plus matters, uh, which are the sort of small conferences we do. Two thirds are uh, closed door conferences, really sort of think tanks, short term think tanks for developing ideas or focusing on special issues for us. And then there's a public side to it. So <clears throat> the first one which took place yesterday or Sunday, Monday was Asian design histories, collecting, curating. And the second one which is coming up uh, next week is Histories and Individual Practices of Contemporary Ink Art. So, um, 
This is something we're doing. We're also, the next upcoming exhibition is Song Dong 36 calendars. Uh, which we do make together with Asia Art Archives. So it's a joint pro uh, project between us. So with that, that's, I'm sure I ran over time. Well, not too bad. Could have been worse. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. So uh, I wonder, as you talk about creating a, a new museum to explore contemporary visual culture, do you think that the explosion of digital culture helps or hinders that? Do you, do you find that audiences are more or less informed about visual culture as a result? I think they're more, well, I should do, I think they're more sophisticated in their use of visuality in general. I think that, I mean, our, I think it's a general understanding that, that, that I mean, we move towards a high degree of visuality and our uh, I, I think our ability to sort of read and navigate in a visual landscape has increased. I mean, uh, increased every. I mean, all individuals have been become more sophisticated. I'm not sure whether that helps us or not. Uh, in in a sense, I, I guess I don't bother about that. You have the situation you have, and and you live and work with it in a in a way. I think that we we definitely have surely will have a more demanding audience uh, and more sophisticated audience when it comes to visuality as a, as a wider genre than we would have had in the 1950s, let's say. I think that's quite clear. And that means that we have to be smarter, we have to s spread ourselves wider, in a sense, hopefully not thinner. Um, so I think it's, it's just a different landscape than it was, let's say, when many of the museums in, in, uh, of modern and contemporary art were, yeah. were formed in the, in, the, in the 50s and 60s in Europe, for example. Tim. Uh, has um, what they've done in Hobart and Minor influenced your planning at all? Have what they've done in? At Minor? Mm -hmm. Yes, mm, a little bit. I mean, I was there. I had a very good visit. Uh, I think that... It's an interesting museum because it's, it's built by someone who, uh, of course, didn't come out of the museum, uh, the museum um, business or museum tradition and so forth. And that, so there are many, there, there's a lot of thinking outside the box. And I think many of the sort of solutions there are really, really good. I mean, obviously this, this tool you have when you walk around, for example, works really well. And it, it reminded me very much of actually uh, a museum I was director of 15 years ago, the Louisiana Museum of Modern Art outside Copenhagen. Not that they're similar, because of course there is 50 years between them, basically, but they were both founded by someone who came from outside, a businessman who had a passion for art and for museum and created a museum to his liking and the way he thought it should be. And that was also a museum that actually broke some new ground, especially in relationship to, I think, the audience and how you treat and look, and look after the public to create a museum that is, gives you a good visit as, and respects the audience. And I think that is also something that is, holds totally true for Mona. So, yes, sure. We look at it. <laughs> Last question right here. Hi, hello. Um, my question is, we've seen increasingly around the world um, exhibitions dedicated to Chinese art. But a main criticism has been that perhaps they've been curated from a Western perspective or along Western art historical lines. For example, new directions of change at the Hayward Gallery that recently took place. Now here in Hong Kong, we're going to have a very interesting opportunity to either A, do it from an Eastern art historical perspective, or maybe even B, write it from an Eastern art historical perspective. Is this something that you've considered extensively? Yes, we have. I mean, this, this is, of course, something we think about a lot. and and. 
I mean, it's 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 relatively complex because I'm I'm not the expert in that field. I would say within the museum, but I was I mean the the, the lead curator in that field is Dr. P. Lee, who is of course a, an art historian and curator who comes out of mainland China and basically grew up with these generations of artists. But I mean, the interesting thing I guess is that that. Chinese contemporary art, of course, also in a certain way modeled itself after Western models. And, in, and it's about the tension between two traditions in a certain, certain way. Just like Hong Kong is really about the sort of, it's, I mean, Hong Kong is about limbo almost. I mean, in, in almost all, all respects, we're in between things. So um, this, is, this is a really important, uh, I think, question to address. And I think that it clearly, I mean, many of the exhibitions of Chinese contemporary art in, in the West, in Europe and America, if you look at the selection, uh, it, it has all, almost always had a focus on certain types of works. I mean, cynical pop and, and certain things that sort of fit a Western idea of what an artist in mainland China would do yeah. and, and, and sort of the take, sort of ironical take on, on communism and party propaganda and mixing that. And of course, if I look, for example, I mean, I didn't mention that, but uh, some months ago we were given a large collection, the Uli Sig collection of Chinese contemporary art. And if you look at that collection, which is a little bit, well, it's about 1,550 works all in all, uh, that part is just a small section of the collection because the ambition with the Uli Sig collection is to tell the story of Chinese contemporary art as it developed. It's the unofficial side of the story. It's not the official Chinese art, but there are only some examples of it. But even the unofficial side, there's only one, uh, a certain section that actually fits this sort of Western idea of what Chinese contemporary artists have been preoccupied with. But there is another side to this discussion, of course, and that is what this next M plus matters uh, discussion is about. It's, it's the relationship between the, the Chinese tradition, the ink art tradition, which is of course uh, also not only a historical tradition but a contemporary tradition and how it fits and doesn't fit into the story and how they, how ink artists think about themselves <laughs> as contemporary artists but also not as contemporary artists in that sense. So it's all, I mean these are things we think a lot about and we work a lot with them and they are rather complex. I don't think there is just an Asian story and a Western story. I think that is, the world is not constructed like that anymore. There are stories, multiple stories and they are interweaned in, in, in different ways. I mean, we live in a global world. Mm. If, well, that's a tautology, I guess, but, yeah. <laughs> but, but you know what I mean. Yeah. So, I can't give you a, a simple answer, I'm afraid. Didn't expect one. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Lars. Uh, I hope that you'll be available if folks have other questions, perhaps. Yep. Yeah. Thank you very much.